As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be storing customer orders in our microservice. We're also going to operate as if we are the single source of truth for customer orders. And our microservice is used by other services to store and obtain this data. Let's open up a new file in our editor to define our data model. I've decided to do this in a new package called model, which will use to store any base data models that our service provides. Let's add a new file called orders.go and open it up. Inside of this file, add the package name of model and define a new struct type called order. Here we can begin adding in our orders properties. The first property we're going to want to add is the order ID. This will represent the unique identifier of our order. This will actually be a value we generate as we'll be the owners of this data. Therefore, we'll need to be the ones to make sure the order is stored as expected. So what type do we want to use for this? Well, this is an interesting one. My go-to preference is usually to define a UUID version 4 as the ID field, which works in a distributed system as it provides enough randomness that collisions are very improbable. However, in our case, we likely want this order ID to also represent an order number, which will be displayed to the customer. And a UUID is not always the most user-friendly. Order numbers are a complex subject and require a lot of properties in a production system. That's probably beyond the scope of this video, however. So in our case, we're just going to store this as a 64-bit unsigned integer. We'll likely be randomly generating it to ensure uniqueness to meet those properties. The next field we want to add in our data model is a customer ID value. In this case, we won't be setting this field as it will likely be external to our system. So we can assume this is going to be a UUID version 4. Now we could store this as a string, but that will require us to validate our input later on. Instead, we should use a custom type to represent this UUID. Fortunately, Google provides a UUID package, which should honestly be part of the standard library at this point. But alas, it isn't. Let's add this to our project using the following go get command. Once that's done, we can import the package and use it to represent our type. Okay, so the next field we want to store is our orders line items. Line items represent the individual item purchases within an order. In order to represent this, we're going to need to create another type. Let's define another struct called line item and we'll add the following properties to it. The first will be the item ID, which represents which item this is. Again, we can imagine there's another service that will be managing this, so we'll just use a UUID to represent this field. Next, we need to add a quantity field, which represents how many of these items were purchased. And finally, we need to add in a price field. This represents the price of a single unit in the line item. We want to store this because the price could theoretically change. And so it's worthwhile to store this with each customer order for the price they paid at the time of purchase. Okay, with our new type defined, let's use it in our order struct and set the line items field with a slice for our new type. The next value we want to represent would be an order status. We could set this using an order status field. Our customer orders will likely have three possible states, created, shipped, and complete. So it would be good to reference the current status of each order in our project. However, this data model is representing the record that we'll be storing in our data store. And so I'd argue there's a better way to actually represent the order status. We can instead use timestamps to represent these values. By doing so, we get the best of both worlds. Because there's an inherent ordering to these different statuses, we can use whichever timestamp is the most latest one to represent which status the order is currently in. Additionally, by keeping a record of when things changed related to the order, we get an audit log of when each status was entered and exited. So let's go ahead and add three fields for these timestamps. We'll need to make sure these are pointers as they can be nil when those states have not been reached, however. So let's add a pointer to a time dot time for created at, shipped at, and completed at. Okay, with that, we have our basic data model defined. The last thing we want to do is add JSON tags to this struct. This will enable us to encode and decode to JSON using the standard library, which we're gonna need to do in a second. To add JSON tags is pretty easy. Here's how it looks for our order ID field. What this does is basically adds a struct tag for JSON type, and it sets the key of this field to whatever value we've set which in this case is order underscore ID. We can go ahead and add these tags to the rest of our fields as well. You'll also need to add the struct tags to the line item struct as well. Once this is done, let's go ahead and commit this change to Git. 
Now we can start to look at adding this data into our data store. For this part, we're going to add a layer of abstraction around our database. We're using Redis in this tutorial, but if it was a production system, you might want something a little bit more consistent with data integrity, such as Postgres or MySQL. Therefore, adding a layer of abstraction means we can easily refactor later on, if we wanted to. To do this, let's create a new package called repository. We'll use this for storing any database connections that our repos will need. Inside, however, we'll create another package called order. This will be used for storing any order-related repositories. Inside of our repository slash order package, let's create a new file called redis.go. Here we're going to add our Redis-based repo. Open this up and add in the package name. Next, we want to create a new struct type called Redis repo. This type will have a client property, which is of type pointer to a Redis client. Now we can start to define our methods. Let's start with the easiest method, which is going to be our insert function. This function will take a context.context .context as the first parameter. By the way, setting the context as the first parameter is the idiomatic approach in Go for any function that takes a context. The second parameter will be our model.order that we can expect our caller to provide. Finally, we can set our return value, which will be an error. As this method is performing a network request, it can potentially fail. So we'll need this error in order to communicate this with the caller. We can also fail for reasons such as the ID already existing in our database. So this defines our insert function, which we're now going to go and implement. As Redis is a key value store, we need to turn our order model into a string so that we can store it. To do this, we're going to encode it as a JSON string, which is why we added our struct tags earlier. Go provides a means to encode into JSON using the encoding slash JSON package, which will take any struct and turn it into a JSON string as described by the JSON tags. To do so, just add in the following line to marshal our order into a byte array. Go uses the terms marshalling and unmarshalling to describe encoding and decoding, respectively. This function can fail, so we should also handle this error in the event it does. Next, we want to generate a unique key to store our value against. As Redis is key value based, there's no tables to group our data by. Instead, we can generate a schema for our key that will perform this grouping for us. Let's create a function for generating an order key, which will take a uint64 as the value and returns a string. Our schema for this key will be as follows, which is order, i.e. the data type, followed by the ID. So order colon ID. Now we can add the encoded order to our data store with our key using the Redis client.set method. The marshal method returns a byte array, so we'll need to cast this to a string. There is also one caveat of using the set method that we need to consider. This caveat is that set will overwrite any data if it exists already, which isn't what we want. We can counter this by instead using the set nx method, where nx stands for not exists. This means the client will not overwrite any data that exists already, instead returning an error. Finally, we can pull out the error using the dot error function of our result, which allows us to communicate if a failure occurred. So far, this is all we need for the insert method. But let's go and move on to our next one. The next method we're going to implement is the counterpart to our insert method, which is going to be find by ID. As with the insert method, our first parameter is going to be the context.context. .context. The second one is going to be our ID field. This is going to be the same ID type we expect in our order model, which is a uint64. This method will return two values, the first being the model.order and the second being an error. As this method is also performing a network request, it can also fail. And we probably want to return an error in case we don't have an order for that ID. Let's move on to implementing this function. We need to use the Redis get method on our order ID. Let's reuse the function to generate a key from our ID that we created earlier and set it to the redis.get method. We'll also make sure we pull out the result of this function. The next thing we need to do is handle any errors that we receive. In this case, if the order doesn't exist for the ID, then the Redis client will return a special error of redis.nil. We'll want to handle this error differently and return our own custom error, telling the caller that the element doesn't exist. To do that, let's first define our custom error. Add in the following line to do so, which creates a new error called error not exist. This works by importing the errors package and creating a new error using the new function. Back in our methods implementation, let's use the errors.is function in order to check if the error is a redis.nil error. If so, we can then make sure to return our own custom error of error not exist instead. Otherwise, we just wrap this error as usual and return that. 
You'll notice that we're returning an empty model.order struct in each of our error cases. This is pretty common in Go, as it's much cheaper to do so than returning a pointer for the success case, as it allocates on the heap. Because we're communicating the lack of an entry via our error return, then this is fine. Finally, we need to convert the JSON data that we receive into our model type. We can do this by using the JSON unmarshal function. We'll need to convert our Redis value into a byte array and make sure that we use the ampersand with our order value. This allows the unmarshal function to make changes to the original order instance. Lastly, make sure to handle the error case for the JSON unmarshal, but this should be pretty familiar to you now. Finally, we can return our order instance. Okay, with these two done, let's move on to our delete by ID method. This one is pretty simple as well. We'll set the parameter of a context.context .context and an ID, and we'll also return an error. For this function, we'll call the del method of the Redis client. We'll also want to return our custom error here if the record doesn't exist that we're trying to delete. This is to communicate that the operation technically failed, although the expected state is still correct. We can let the handler decide what to do with this information. Next, let's add a method for our update command. This method will take the context and model parameters and return our familiar error. This one is similar to our insert method. However, we only want to update existing records. So we can achieve this in Redis by using the setXX method, which means that we only set our value if it already exists. Otherwise, this is pretty much similar to our insert method and the delete method that we've seen before. Finally, we move on to our find all method, which is going to be a little bit more complex. This method will expect the same context parameter and return both a slice of orders and an error. However, when it comes to our result, we need to think a little bit more carefully. It's actually a bad idea to retrieve every record out of Redis, as this could be expensive to do so, especially when the number of records in our database increases. So what we want to do is accept a couple of other parameters in order to support something called pagination. What pagination does is it allows us to break down the results into separate pages, which means the client can request more data each time without us having to pull all of it out. To do this, we'll create a new type called find all page, which will contain two other parameters, a size and an offset, or you can name this a count and a cursor if you really want. In order to support pagination, we actually need to change the way we store our customer orders. Currently, we're just storing them using the key and the value which is fine for retrieving individual records by ID, but can be expensive to retrieve pages of them. What we want to do is store our order IDs in a set called orders. To implement this, we can head back on over to our insert function and add in the following lines, which we'll call the sad or set add method of our order key to our new set. And we'll make sure to handle this error as well. Okay, so this will work, but there's a failure point here. What happens if we succeed in inserting our new order, but then we fail to add it to our orders set? Well, if that happens, we'll end up in a partial state, which is really not good. We could add another process to reconcile this state, but this adds a lot of complexity. Instead, it's better to use something called a transaction, which will group commands together so that they are atomic, i.e. all of them will work or none of them at all. We can do this in Redis using the multi command, which is invoked by the Redis client using the TX pipeline method. Let's call this at the top of our insert function to start a new transaction. This will begin the transaction for us in a new pipelined client, which we can then use for our subsequent commands. In our insert function, we can then replace instances of our client calls to our new transaction client. By doing so, none of these commands will apply until we commit them, which we can do by using the exec method at the end of our function. This helps us with a level of data guarantee so that we're not left in a partial state. And if we do encounter an error, we can use the discard method to discard any potential changes. Okay, with our insert method updated, we now need to do something similar for our delete by ID method. Inside, let's create a transaction as we did before and use this for our del method. Let's add in the discards for any errors and then call the srem method to remove our key from the order set. Finally, we can call the exec method and we should be good. We can jump back on over to our find all method. First, we need to change our return value to return a new struct called find result. This struct will define our orders, but also the next cursor, so that the caller knows where to pick up from. This is because Redis cursors aren't sequential, so we need to let the caller know where we got to in order to resume paging from. After that, we can call the sscan or setscan method with our context, our set key, and our page offset. 
The match value, which is an asterisk, means everything in the set and the page size. Let's capture this in a result value and then pull all of the values out on the next line. Here we capture the keys, the cursor, and any error, which we will go ahead and handle. One thing to note here is that our records will be returned in random order. This is a side effect of using a set and is to be expected. Redis does have an ordered set that may be preferable in a case we want to return our customer orders in a sorted manner, using the created at field or something else. This is a great chance to extend the code and develop your own understanding, so I highly recommend playing around with it once we're done. Now that we're pulling out all of the keys from our set, we need to pull out the individual values. We can do this using an mget, which stands for multi-get, and allows us to pass in all of our keys to this single Redis call. As this function accepts a variadic array, we can pass in a slice by using the three dots. Again, let's handle the error here, and then we can go about unwrapping these into our order slice. To do so, we first create an order slice which has the same length as our resulting slice. Next, we have to iterate over each of the elements in our result array and cast each element to a string. Then we can unmarshal that string into an order struct, which we will then store in our order slice at the current index. Finally, we can return our find result which contains our orders and our next cursor. Oh, I've forgotten one thing. Head back to the line before our mget method and we can check the keys size. If the keys are empty, then we may as well just return an empty list at this point. If we don't do this, then the mget function will not be happy if we try to send an empty list of keys. With that, we've successfully managed to implement our data repository. Let's go ahead and commit this code before moving on to the integration with our handler.